Hello and um, welcome to the second um, webinar in our series uh, for the uh, chair initiative of our um, of the Western Governors Association uh, Working Lands, Working Communities. My name is Troy Timmons. I work for the Western Governors Association. Um, our conversation today will be on conservation markets in the West, and we've got three great um, panelists to, to discuss this uh, really complicated but really important subject. Um, so Rayanne Dubay is the Assistant State Conservationist for Programs with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, I should say you're the Assistant State Con in California. Um, and uh, let's see, Tom Fry, you are the Western Director for the American Forest Foundation. Um, Zach Bodane is Policy Director for the Western Landowners Alliance. Um, each of these people is an expert in their field. <clears throat> what to do with conservation markets. What really what we're talking about is how you incentivize um, the activities that we want on landscapes. And um, that's to, I, I'm stealing this from uh, a, a good friend of mine, Laura Schweitzer, um, who talks about um, whether, you can look at it two different ways. You are incentivizing, um, you are incentivizing behaviors on property, or you are incentivizing um, those in products from that. So it's you can you can take your you can take your pick. You're incentivizing practices, or you're incentivizing products, um, and. So we're going to what we're going to hear today is is kind of a mix of both of those uh, incentive structures. Uh, they're very different in terms of of what happens on landscapes as a result. Um, but I think both of them have a place in how we conduct um, our work um, and trying to increase ecosystem resilience. Um, on lands and mitigate wildfire danger, make sure that we're protecting habitat, um, all of those different uh, values that we try to get out of land. Um, so with that, we'll get into, uh, we'll let everybody do a, a quick open, get into some uh, questions and discussion. If you're watching this, um, use that, Q and A function at the bottom of your screen there, um, and and we'll make sure that those get added into the discussion. Um, and so Rayan, we'll start off with you, um, and then we'll go to Tom and and Zach can bring us home. So thanks again for taking the time to to join us today, and we look forward to a really good discussion. Thanks. Great, thanks Troy. Uh, so again, uh, Rayanne Dubay, I am the Assistant State Conservationist for Programs in California for the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. And I'm very happy to be here today. I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about a new program that was authorized under the 2018 Farm Bill, and it's called the Conservation Incentive Contracts Program, and it is underneath EQIP, that's the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. Um, I do have a slideshow uh, because there are a lot of details associated with the program, and I'm going to cover some of those uh, just really quickly. USDA uh, NRCS is an organization that is dedicated to working with uh, private farmers, ranchers, private forest landowners, uh, doing conservation on their private lands uh, in the hopes that it is in combination with production. Uh, so the two should be compatible with each other, conservation and production. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now, and we'll see if this works. Um, I'll ask for some confirmation here. Uh, can you let me know if you just see the PowerPoint presentation? Looks good, Rayanne. Okay, so you don't see your little boxes over the top of it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do. Well, I do, but, I, but probably the viewers don't. So okay. we're in good well, shape. Let me, uh, I just want to make sure that it's not covering anything up. So, all right. I'm going to move that a little bit here. 
Oops, I moved it too much now. Well, anyway, we'll just keep rolling with it. Okay, so uh, environmental quality incentives program, conservation incentives contracts. Um, EQIP has been around for a very long time. Uh, and it's the most popular program that we have at USDA NRCS. It pays for a lot of conservation practices that really correct resource concerns on the landscape. Um, so this program is very similar. It provides the financial and technical assistance to producers to um, implement and adopt management practices on their property. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that emphasis on management practices as we go along. Uh, one of the key things to the CIC program is that it is, allows states to address priority resource concerns within the state. Um, and the other key thing about the program is that it's intended to raise the level of stewardship of our producers um, in areas where they've not been able to get into a, a more more restrictive program, that's the Conservation Stewardship Program. That one is a program where you enroll all of your acres uh, and it requires some minimum stewardship thresholds. We do realize there are some producers out there that those, those uh, sets of requirements can be somewhat limiting. So this is somewhat of a stepping stone between those two programs where we're still looking at some of the resource concerns, um, but we're attempting to get people to a higher level of management, but not requiring that they enroll their entire operation. So this is the first year that this program is rolled out nationwide. And last year there was a pilot and it was only in the Western states. I believe it was Arizona, uh, Colorado, um, Oregon and California. So this year nationwide. Okay, let's see about getting to the next slide here. Okay, so state priorities. Uh, the additional priorities that are built into the program by the state um, are something that we usually use our state technical committees to help us uh, design. Uh, state technical committees are a group of federal and state organizations, uh, local entities, uh, producer groups that all advise our state conservationists on, on how to address resource concerns within the state. So we can identify geographic priority areas where we target the program. We also identify the priority resource concerns within those geographic areas. Um, we also identify the land uses where those priority resource concerns are going to be addressed. Um, we also come up with a set of incentive practices that go along with all of that. The states do have minimum and maximum thresholds for funding that they can apply towards this program. Uh, at a minimum, a state can set aside 200,000 or 5% of their equip allocation, uh, whichever one is smaller. And at the maximum, it's 20% of a state equip allocation. So just to, for reference, uh, in California this year, we did set aside the minimum, which is the 5%, which happens to be about $2.5 million here in California. So high priority areas, how are they distinguished within a state? Um, the states can go by administrative boundaries. Uh, it could be part of an area, a region, um, some other administrative geography. It can be biophysical, like a watershed. It can be related to anything that I prioritize as a resource concern within a geography. Um, state uh, source water protection programs are a big part of what we have used and seen in other states. Also groundwater basins that can be um, threatened are also something that we see a lot of states targeting. You can also address the entire state if you'd like to. Um, over there on the right, I've just dropped an image of what it looks like in California. Uh, we have one boundary that encompasses the entire state, and it's available for forest range and pasture. Uh, we also have the Klamath Basin, which has a unique set of uh, water issues that are happening up there. A lot of water cutbacks happening in the Klamath. Then we have our Central Valley cropland, that San Joaquin area in the gray there. Uh, that is a priority area for us um, because of the agriculture that is grown within that area. So that's just to give you an example of how the states are carving up uh, and providing funds throughout their state. So the practices. Uh, this year, when they rolled the program out, the National Office focused the list of practices on climate smart agriculture, forestry, and drought mitigation. Uh, there is a list of 32 management practices that are eligible for the program. Uh, they've all got a one-year lifespan. New this year, you're going to see conservation evaluation and monitoring activities. That's a new area that NRCS has developed. 
Uh, typically, we are on the planning and implementation side. The monitoring side of once a uh, practice is installed is something that uh, we've been missing a little bit in our, our toolbox. So it's been added this year, and there are a few SEMAs that are available. SEMA, that's the acronym for it. Um, states can also further limit the list of practices that are eligible. So I do have a list here. Uh, this might be a little bit hard to read, but the management practices are fairly typical. Uh, they do apply to most land uses. Uh, there's something for everyone, so to speak, cover crops, uh, mulching, there's prescribed grazing, uh, pest management, salinity, there's some habitat in there. And then at the very bottom, you see the list of the conservation evaluation and monitoring activities that are available within the program. Okay, so contracting and payments. Uh, these contracts are five years in, in length. Uh, the payment limitation associated with a CIC contract is $200,000. That is a separate payment limitation from all of our other programs. Uh, there are two types of practice payments associated with it. One is an implementation payment, which is for a practice that you don't see on the previous list. So, the previous list, let me go back up here. This is the core set of practices that are available. The entire list of equip conservation practices are available for producers through this program. Um, however, those are considered uh, something that are additional. They're supporting practices to the rest. So those additional practices not on that list would be considered an implementation practice and they would be certified and paid at installation. The annual payments are associated with the list of practice that I just showed you. Uh, those annual payments are made annually after October 1st. And uh, as long as you have a practice in a contract, it would get paid uh, each year after October 1st. For historically underserved producers, we also have uh, the option for making advanced payments for those that need a little bit of help to get off the ground. And then just last but not least, uh, just a little snapshot here on how to apply uh, and find more information. It's pretty hard to click on the screen. So I think I heard you say that some of this would be available to folks after the fact, and I can certainly uh, drop this link in the chat after we're done having a conversation here. So with that, um, I, I've been asked to hand off the conversation to Tom from American Forest Foundation. So Tom, I will stop sharing my screen and give you the microphone. Fantastic, thank you very much, Rayanne. Um, and uh, uh, thanks also to Troy and the, the folks at WGA, I appreciate the invitation to be here. Uh, and, and honestly, the work that you guys do to, to daylight and convene these conversations around some of these really uh, uh, important critical topic areas. Um, unlike Rianne, I, I don't have a formal presentation per se, and I'm gonna I'm gonna come at this from a slightly different angle. Um, my my hope is that by offering a few thoughts and, and observations on some of the work that we're doing, I uh, can add fodder for the discussion, and, and really looking forward to that uh, that back and forth. Um, like Rianne, let me let me just uh, uh, start with a quick word on my organization, uh, the American Forest Foundation. Uh, we are a conservation NGO uh, based in Washington, D.C., but uh, with programs uh, across the country. Um, our, our mission and our focus is to, not unlike NRCS, empower um, non-industrial private forest landowners to do right by their land. Uh, we're talking about family landowners, folks that have 10, 20, 50 acres. Um, and collectively, we think the, the, the action or the inaction of these folks matters a heck of a lot if you stop and uh, recognize that collectively, um, this ownership group actually owns more forest land in the United States than the federal government. Um, we have program areas in carbon and biodiversity, but in the West, our sole focus is on the issue of wildfire. Um, and I'm not gonna get into the, the nuts and bolts of fire, even if, even if we, we had the time. Um, suffice to say, it took uh, well over 100 years to get into this mess, um, and it will take time and, frankly, a whole lot of money uh, to dig ourselves out of this hole, um, the hole that is the, the fire crisis that the West is facing. Um, the, the good news, I think, is that uh, decision makers at both the state and federal levels are uh, significantly upping their investment in risk reduction. You know, I think about uh, Oregon and certainly California 
uh, uh, but also the, the recently passed Infrastructure and Jobs Act. Um, and, and maybe most importantly, in addition to that uh, additional funding, um, is the, the, the pivot or the orientation of, of those investments rather than um, uh, spreading the peanut butter uh, as thin as we have over the last couple of decades, really making concentrated and long-term investments um, and not only in just hardening the communities that are, are potentially impacted by fires, but, but as much in the forest fuels that are fueling these blazes uh, in the first place. Um, if that's the good news, then I think the bad news is that it's, it's really unlikely uh, that the public sector alone uh, will be able to pay for the scale of work that ultimately is necessary. And so when I think about conservation markets, right, my head immediately goes to the private sector um, and crowding in that funding to help achieve a conservation outcome like fire risk reduction. Uh, those public private partnerships. And in the fire space, we see uh, a little bit of that. Water utilities and power companies are underwriting some portion of the work uh, in their backyards. But uh, if, we're honest with our, if we're honest with ourselves, I think by and large, there is very little business line investment um, in hazardous fuels reduction. And I think the chief reason we don't see companies, companies like Google or Amazon, uh, Microsoft, what have you, investing in fuels reduction is that we haven't established a robust data-driven value uh, for that work. Um, you know, if you think about the nature of a market uh, or a marketplace, right, at its core, it's the exchange of, of money uh, for goods and services, right? And keystone to what I think makes a market tick is that we have an established price and a known value for whatever it is that we're exchanging or trading that money for, right? Um, in the fire space, we know the price and we know to be damned expensive, but if we're honest with ourselves, we have a heck of a time of, of substantiating the value of what that cost offers. Um, and so if, if we, AFF or others in the fire space contemplate approaching a for-profit company uh, for an investment, uh, maybe a for-profit for company that is thinking about their shareholders, uh, and we say, you know, we need to invest in this work, we get a question uh, in response to our question, uh, which is, what's it worth to me? Um, and frankly, we don't necessarily have a really good answer to that, uh, that good question. We point to the science, right? We say, boy, the science tells us that if we do reduce these fuels, we, we protect assets. And we have all kinds of anecdotal information on, on cost savings. But ultimately, we're pretty well stymied. Um, and, and we get passed off to the, the company's philanthropic shop. Um, and, and it's hard establishing that value because we're effectively proving the negative, right? the value of avoiding something bad. It's not, it's not a tangible thing that you can hold in your hands. Um, and because of that methodology, how you establish that value matters and it, it matters a lot. Um, so in, in late 2020, AFF partnered uh, with Risk Management Solutions, RMS. Uh, they are a, a global risk modeling firm um, that just happened to be recently acquired by Moody's. And I, and I think that there's an interesting storyline there where we can get into in the discussion. Um, and a couple of months ago, we published a technical paper reviewing the work that we did with RMS to build out that methodology. Uh, and, and our core question um, was whether or not we could establish a business case for a company's major capital investment in fuels reduction. Because again, we're not talking about philanthropic uh, contributions. We're trying to hardwire this into uh, the business line uh, to crowd in these resources. Um, and overall, the, the methodology that we worked on uh, and developed, it, it's a pretty straightforward approach, right? So RMS has a probabilistic fire model that predicts um, average annual loss. Um, and average annual loss through that fire modeling says to uh, uh, their for-profit audiences, in any given year, this is what you can expect to lose, right? On average, as we model fire over the next 50 years, um, you can expect to lose this in any given year. Um, and 
in that work, we, we establish a no action alternative, right? What's the predicted loss that um, someone may face, a community may face uh, without taking action? Um, and then we played around with a whole host of different fuel treatment configurations. You know, we looked at different scales of treatment, treating different fuel types, different directionality of treatment. Um, and, and in that we captured the predicted loss associated um, with each of those. And then we just looked at the Delta, right? The Delta and those values with the core question being, is the financial value of fewer homes and businesses burning in any given year worth more than the cost of the treatments themselves? Um, and uh, the, the short answer is, is sort of. Um, I mean, I've got a raft of slides and charts and graphics and tables, um, but for, for our purposes today, I'll just try to summarize in brief that by reducing fuel loading, um, we actually see, depending on the fuel treatment scenario, uh, 21 to a 59% reduction in probable financial loss. Um, and when you weigh that avoided loss against the cost of treatments, um, at least initially and on paper, it looks like, well, heck, you can pay back that investment in just a, in a handful of years. So, you know, we get pretty excited about that. Um, and then we step back and we start to think about it. And you know what, again, going back to the idea of approaching a company and making a business case for this kind of investment, is something like that gonna cut the mustard? And, and I don't think the, I think the answer is, is no. So in this work with RMS, we also looked at the net present value of those fuel treatments, right? Because um, the sophistication that we need to bring to bear in having these conversations um, uh, is such that we have to look at how well, frankly, vegetation trees grow. Those treatments degrade and their value degrades over time. And it costs money to maintain those treatments. And if we think about front loading uh, the, the, the financing into the treatments themselves, that's a boatload of money and there are interest rates associated with underwriting those treatments. And so when we try to take a more holistic uh, business look at the cost and value of this work over time, um, we really begin to see that um, it, it not in all scenarios and in some scenarios, um, we really don't start to recoup those investments until the out years. And I'm talking to like a decade, uh, 13, 15 years out. Um, there's no question in my mind, having done this work with RMS, that there is uh, uh, there there, if you will. There is a path, there is a positive ROI to fuels treatments. Uh, to the private sector, but it's going to take more time and attention to make that business case. Um, I know that I'm, I'm probably running up on time here, so um, let me let me just circle up with with uh, the, the take home, and and circle back to this idea of conservation markets and incentives. Um, and, and again, I'll reiterate when when I think about conservation my, markets, my my mind goes immediately to the private sector. Um, and it frankly has been a windmill that we have been tilting at for a long time, payment for ecosystem services. Um, and, and I think we've been tilting at this windmill for as long as we have because um, as a community, we've relied on the power of stories and the soundness of the science to make our case. And, and maybe being Captain Obvious here, but um, at the end of the day, stories and science don't necessarily a business case make. Um, again, it's hard nose, it's valuation, it's investments with dividends, it's about the metrics that matter to the buyer. Um, it's about rock solid data. Um, and if we're gonna get good in this conservation market space, I think we have to anticipate <coughs> far better um, those business line questions that we're gonna be faced with, walking uh, you know, a mile, so to speak, in the shoes of those with whom or for whom we wish to uh, invest. And then last but not least, I'll just offer a quick observation on the, on the incentive side of the, and, and more specifically the policy incentive side, that if, you know, if we're so fortunate to have established a willingness to pay, um, there's interest from a private sector actor to invest in this. And um, based on their perceived value, uh, the financial value of the return, I do think that there are some creative things that we can do in the policy space to incentivize or to bring um, and further catalyze and accelerate some of those, those actors and those conversations. So I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, really appreciate again, Troy, uh, you and WGA 
Um, uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here and my great pleasure to uh, turn the program over to Zach with WLA. Great, well, thanks so much for that, Tom. And yeah, just wanna reiterate the thanks to WGA for holding this discussion. Um, I know it's something that's front and center on many, many landowners' minds, so it's it's a timely discussion. Um, my name is Zach Boudet and I'm the policy director for Western Landowners Alliance. For folks who may not be familiar with WLA, just wanna give a quick background. We're a landowner founded, landowner led, nonpartisan organization for the West Wide Footprint. Work in a number of issue areas across uh, some different um, structures in the organization from programs work, supporting stewardship on the ground to policy work at both the state and federal level. Also have a communication shop that works on uh, educating the general public about the value of working land stewardship. We have a pretty diverse membership, both in terms of their geography, scope of their operations and their perspectives, but what really brings, brings us together and binds us is a love of the land and a deep appreciation for stewardship. We hope to, again, build through our organization just a better public understanding of the critical function that working lands play in holding together functional, resilient landscapes and supporting communities across the West. Um, so I, I want to start by, I guess, providing kind of an overall bigger picture perspective, sort of above the discussion around individual markets. And that's our observation on the need to better align economic systems with long-term land and water stewardship. So well-managed private and working lands are already providing countless public benefits, whether it's habitat for average species, migrating wildlife, healthy forests and watersheds, improved soil health, carbon storage, you name it. Um, all that, of course, on top of providing food and fiber. Many of these benefits are uncompensated or severely undercompensated given the return that the public is receiving. Um, so, you know, for many producers, the cost of a pound of beef is really going to dictate what the economic return is that they see on their operation, regardless of what other land and water stewardship efforts may be ongoing. Um, that's maybe a little bit oversimplified, but I think that is that is the case for many folks. And, you know, we, we, we have to be honest here that the market of that structure is not going to be or is not all that responsive when it comes to rewarding land and water stewardship. If a pound of beef grown in a cornfield in the Midwest costs roughly the same as a pound of beef grown in the Northern Rockies in a biodiverse landscape shared with species that the public values, such as wolves and grizzly bears, then we need to recognize that our economic system is a little bit out of alignment with the stewardship that it's being asked to provide. So um, in saying that, you know, I don't want to discount a lot of the good work going on there by people who do recognize this issue and the groups that are working to change that. Um, the Audubon Conservation Ranching Initiative is a good example where folks can be certified and expect a premium. But, you know, the truth is many producers just still don't have access to adequate options to see those types of premiums returned on the stewardship they invest in their land and the public values provided. So. That's, I think, where we see conservation markets and other income diversification opportunities becoming so important to kind of make up that delta there, uh, especially as pressures on operations increase from drought to wildfire to development. Conservation markets and other income, income diversification opportunities can play a key role in ensuring that our well stewarded working landscapes remain economically viable. So. One opportunity that we see here to address this challenge holistically is through what we call a uh, habitat lease. And the concept is pretty straightforward. It's provide per acre annual payments over a long period of time, say 10 to 30 years to landowners to support the baseline cost of providing essential wildlife habitat and related conservation values that are compatible with agriculture. Um, particularly when providing those values would otherwise reduce the landowner's ability to generate income. So essentially the baseline payments there are to reward landowners that are already providing habitat. And then depending on how they're structured, you, know, you could add addi additional payments, cost share, technical assistance, opportunities to expand stewardship practices if you want. Um, it's important to note that, you know, we see this tool as complementary with easements. A lease is gonna offer far less financial incentive and security than a permanent easement would, but can be a useful alternative for some that are looking to secure long-term viability and again, maintain the functionality of landscapes in the near term. Um, and to see an example of this type of structure in action, you can look to the Farm Bill. There's the Grassland Conservation Reserve Program, or I'll call it a Grassland CRP, which is an example that's pretty similar to this structure. Uh, the USDA Farm Service Agency offers per acre, per acre rental payments to landowners across a certain acreage they offer on their property in exchange for that land staying out of development and being managed as grassland. Um, grazing can still continue, which makes this kind of a unique distinction under CRP, where it is, you know, very very clearly a working lands program um, in, you know, um, uh, and, and compared to some of the other options there. 
So the looking at the 2018 Farm Bill and Grassland CRP in particular, it also created some new provisions in 2018 that allow this program to um, cover ecologically sensitive land, such as habitat for at-risk, at threatened, and endangered species or migration corridors. Um, those lands being integrated into the 28 Farm Bill and allowing them to both qualify and be prioritized, I think as we saw it unlocked a lot of opportunity in the West, and we've seen record enrollment in the program in recent years as a result. So I think it's clear that, that those changes are working for the West. Um, but there's still more that can be done there. Uh, and I know it's an area that USDA is eager to explore. Um, you know, I think they're they're eager to look at how to meet this desire for this type of structure um, and are currently, I know, exploring a template to combine a number of different farm bill programs along these lines uh, through a pilot in Wyoming. And, you know, I know they're they're eager to work with states, landos, landowners, other parties to refine this and improve it in coming months and years. Um, so, you know, with that in mind and the 2023 Farm Bill on the horizon, I think there's just a lot of opportunities here to kind of explore what tools are in the toolkit, what the authorities currently can and can't allow, and then figure out how we can address that and codify some of these concepts coming up. And then finally, I think, you know, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't discuss something that I know is on a lot of people's minds right now, and that's carbon and climate markets. There's clearly a lot of opportunity here. Uh, you know, we also hear about a fair amount of uncertainty. I think from our perspective, a concern is that the West could be left behind. Um, you know, if carbon sequestration is the only metric that's in play or, or the main metric being measured, the arid West and in particular range is just not gonna score out as well as many other parts of the country. That's just the reality of it. Um, but if you look at the bigger picture, there's already an existing carbon sink that exists across Western intact, uh, very large landscapes. And the ability to, you know, consistently increase carbon sequestration on those landscapes in an arid environment is definitely a question, but we do know that avoided conversion is going to be a big deal to keeping those carbon sinks intact. So that's where, again, it comes back to these, um, you know, this notion of economics mattering. And we need economics that promote stewardship, and we need market solutions that can avoid land conversion, and those need to be thought about in concert with carbon and climate markets. So, you know, I think there's also a, a a potential concern around perverse incentive structures to be developed, depending on how some of these carbon markets develop. You know, there's theoretical scenarios where you could convert native range to a monoculture or switch to a more intensive use that could, you know, in theory, increase the carbon sequestration potential of a patch of ground um, that would possibly come at the cost to biodiversity or other benefits. Um, and then, you know, it's hard to say if that would actually play out. But I think I just wanted to more plant that flag that we need to be thoughtful in designing these markets to ensure that we're not taking one step forward in terms of providing landowners opportunity to market natural climate solutions at the same time taking two, two steps back in the context of broader landscape health and connectivity. Um, you know, on, on the carbon market side, there's also just the, the sheer number of potential options and variable structures out there. And on this front, I think can be overwhelming for landowners and that's not unique to the carbon space. Um, and, and, you know, I, I do just want to say we need to think carefully along those lines what the government's role should be in qualifying, certifying, and overseeing these private markets. I think we've seen examples in the past where federal policy, um, in particular, my mind goes to compensatory mitigation on wildlife exchanges or habitat exchanges, you know, kind of sets up a market that policy then changes or is rescinded entirely, and those market opportunities really dry up in a hurry. So that type of whiplash just isn't good for landowners and isn't good for business that are interested in these opportunities. So I think we need to carefully think about, you know, what the government's role is in setting these markets is. Um, one final note on that, that I do just want to flag the Growing Climate Solutions Act is an interesting opportunity, I think, along those lines on the carbon market side. Without going into too much detail there, um, the gist is it would create a voluntary technical assistance provider and third party certification program at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, that would hopefully help landowners access environmental credit markets. So I think, you know, it's an opportunity to create more durability and predictability um, that at the same time can be combined with the flexibility and ingenuity of private markers, uh, private actors in the marketplace. And I think that combination is really going to be a key component to these types of markets getting off the ground. Um, so I'll stop there. Welcome your questions and looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Zach, and Tom, and Rayanne. And I actually, before we get to, to q and I, I want to follow up on, on Zach's um, comments on markets. And uh, one, of the, 
points there. And maybe Rayan, you could, well, shoot, all of you can opine on this one. But so when you've got government programs that are incentivizing certain behaviors, uh, you if we have a market system that is also incentivizing behaviors and in a in a carbon context, how do those how do you, how do you make sure those play well together in terms of incentivizing the activities you want, right? Um, and making just making sure that they're all driving in the same direction. If you were in charge of setting up carbon markets um, and and building a structure that was going to be functional and uh, drive towards the right outcomes in in the in especially in Western states for the all the reasons you described, um, how would you go about? setting that up and maybe maybe not to totally put you on the spot and make you come up with a program right now but what are some of the things that if you were designing that that program you would want to be make sure folks were really thinking about to come up with a balanced intelligent structure that that drives to the outcomes we really want that are going to improve ecosystem health, resilience, um, mitigate wild, uncharacteristic wildfire risk, uh, promote good habitat, um, and don't contribute to some of those perverse uh, incentive structures that you were talking about for that would lead to poor management in, in a lot of Western landscapes. That's not too much to ask for, is it? Sure, no, not at all. <laughs> I, I guess I'm, I'm gonna just kick this off here and I'm gonna say that, uh, you know, if we had a really great answer to that, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation right now, number one. Um, number two, uh, I think I deal with that conversation on lots of scales daily. Um, you know, how do we make sure, you know, here in California that we're working in concert with our state and local partners to, to achieve, you know, the same realistic values and goals um, across the spectrum. Um, you know, I do think that it does require a significant amount of pre-planning uh, just to, when it comes down to it. You know, I know that uh, just the way that our organization works, we get a lot of public input. Uh, whether it's at the national level, local level, congressional level, um, that really drives the direction that we're going. And so it's it's really the involvement of our partners um, and, and how involved they are, right, and, and our understanding our system and how we're rolling things out um, and being vocal about what it is that's important to them that's really going to help, um, at least from my perspective. Um, you know, we're managing a, a lot of federal programs and, and rolling them out, and we're we're doing the best that we can to make sure that it's meeting the needs of the constituents out there, and that includes our partner base. Um, and it's the pre-planning in my world that it really comes down to is making sure that those conversations are, are active and happening. And I know that that's a really uh, a tough a tough thing to make happen because there are so many conversations to be involved in these days. Um, so, you know, it, diligence, passion, um, staying connected, all of that critically important. It's, it's a very lofty answer, um, but it's where I'm going to stand on this one. So <laughs> I'm going to leave some of the nuts and bolts to the, the two gentlemen who probably deal with uh, the specifics of some, you know, storytelling and science. On, on how it might work going forward. And, and I'm all ears to hear what they've got to say. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take a stab at it, Troy. <laughs> um, you know, I guess if you're, if you're talking about kind of trying to capture everything in one program, I guess my reaction to that is that that might not be a very good program. <laughs> I think if you if you try to do everything, you end up doing nothing. Um, and, and that, I guess, you know, from our perspective is some of the appeal of looking at this through the lens of what we think we can control. Um, in, in the context of avoided conversion. So 
you know, we have some tools in the toolkit there in terms of easements, you know, we've seen some of these other programs um, like Grassland CRP and some of these other structures be effective. So I think if we can look at, you know, in theory, the a, a well managed pat, um, you know, patch of ground that is in native range is going to be providing as much as it can from in the context of carbon sequestration or wildlife habitat. Um, and then let's just figure out a structure, whether it's per acre payments, cost share assistance, you know, practices, what have you, to keep that patch of ground as it is, um, and look to improve it. You know, find find innovative mechanisms and structures to to build on top of that. So, I think you know the the that's that's why we find a lot of appeal in, in kind of the simplicity of per acre payment rates. But I know that's probably not going to get it done everywhere, and we recognize that. Uh, yeah, I don't know where to begin either. Um, where, where my mind goes to uh, is the, 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 again, maybe Captain Obvious here, that uh, the existing carbon markets are, are arguably pretty narrow uh, and that there's a tremendous opportunity to expand uh, the, the scope of those markets, whether it's like as Zach is describing, um, thinking about uh, conversion and, and not so much sequestering more carbon, but not losing the carbon that we already have. Um, there are market opportunities in my space, in fire, in thinking about um, avoided emissions, right? Uh, fire is both symptom of and exacerbator of climate change. Um, so how do we think about new market opportunities in the climate carbon space that aren't limited to bringing carbon down from the atmosphere? And again, you know, broken record to, to me, um, it goes to that, that valuation um, and understanding not only what we think it's worth, but who's willing to buy it and what do they think it's worth. Um, it's not sufficient for us to say, this is what it's worth if no one's willing to buy it, right? There's gotta be a give and a take and anticipating that market dynamic of who are the buyers, who are the payers, what do they wanna see? Um, that I think is, you know, again, cornerstone to the establishment of any marketplace. That, that leads to a really uh, interesting question around, especially as this IJ money starts to flood in and hopefully work starts getting done on the ground, you potentially have a ton of, well, not ton, like zillions of tons of product. And that can be rangeland biomass, that can be trees, that can be all the junk that's sitting on a forest floor and a lot of low value stuff. So one of the questions there becomes, what, what is that product? And what is it used for? And, and especially if you really are aggressive about, about especially wildfire mitigation, what do you do with all that stuff? And uh, and what kind of effects that has on markets? Well, it, at least existing markets. Um, this, and some of these, especially if you're if you're talking about using it for for biofuels, that's one of the ideas out there for a lot of this low grade material. Uh, does that what what other market effects does? The introduction of all this new material have, and and are there you know what kind of steps you can take to mitigate it? I'm I'm not saying that you guys would have answers for any of that, but I just point out that that's definitely something uh, a concern, especially as as some of this infrastructure money gets piled into the market. Um, one other, one of the questions, and the question really uh, boils down to this, but and it's for Tom. Um, when, yeah, okay. Um, when you're using RMS, uh, what are some of the risk factors that you're using in that analysis? 
and I think really the question is around what are those tangible factors, risk factors? Do you make any effort to look at those at intangible costs like smoke effects on healthcare? Um, do those get integrated into that? And if so, how? Uh, I, I, the short answer is I, I used to believe and in, in, in my wildest dreams would love for uh, uh, you know, effectively one approach, one methodology to rule them all, uh, to be able to account for all of the impacts associated with this issue fire um, in one fell swoop. And boy, howdy, if we could establish a metric that spoke, spoke to healthcare companies as much as they did to water utilities, as much as they did to the telecom industry, as much as we did to the insurance sector, uh, we would be cooking with something. But I think the, the real practical fact of the matter is, is that, um, you know, again, metrics and what you're measuring matters. So a method, it, it, in my mind, it's, it's all but impossible to develop that one methodology that speaks to all the potential investors, right? Um, Denver Water cares about avoided sedimentation. And that's what they're going to pay for. AT&T doesn't care about avoided sedimentation, right? They're concerned about avoided downtime. Um, Kaiser Permanente is not so much avoid, you know, interested in avoided downtime as they are in um, upticks in emergency healthcare costs, right? Um, so again, I, I, I adopt and, and try to uh, own a frame of mind that we've got to put ourselves in the buyer's shoes in this marketplace. What are the buyers willing to pay for and develop the methodology and the valuation based on their interest. Now, again, if we had one valuation, one methodology to rule them all, um, I would retire early, but I just, I don't see that in our, our near-term future. One of the other questions, um, it's, Well, okay. Uh, let me make this point because it was it was in the in the text of that that question is that uh, count the uh, West Western Forestry Leadership Coalition. Sorry, <laughs> I always struggle with that one. Um, uh, that WIFLA group is updating. Uh, the, it's true cost of wildfire study, um, which also it sounds like it says some of the same issues uh, that that you're trying to look at, Tom. Um, and the the question was, to what extent can uh, these risk factors and the costs associated with them uh, help in uh, justifying pre-fire mitigation activities? Uh, and, and how can, how can that, you know, basically, how can those be integrated into a more effective discussion about the cost effectiveness of mitigation work? Yep. And I, and I think the work that, that I described a little bit with RMS, and, and we're not the only ones trying to establish, uh, you know, evaluation for pre-fire mitigation work. Um, there's there's a, a, a handful of other outfits out there that are looking at different impacts. The, w the way that I tend to think about that, Troy, that the, the work that Laura and the folks at WIFLIC are doing with the true cost of wildfire um, is painting a picture. Right, it is evidence and um, affirmation of the challenge at hand. Um, you know the old adage, right? A, a, a pound of prevention worth an ounce of cure, vice versa, I guess. Um, fire costs forty thousand bucks an acre, but uh, when all is said and done, but it's only twenty five hundred bucks an acre to to address the problem on the front end. Um, that's part of the illustration and the storytelling that brings and catalyzes uh, the, the, the conversations that we need to have. But that's not a business case, right? I can't go to any private sector actor and say, give me a hundred million dollars to protect your assets in this watershed, fire shed, sub watershed based on the overall cost of fire. 
right? They're going to want to know specifically if I treat and underwrite treatment on this acre, work with this producer, this landowner, what's my ROI? Um, so I think it's hand in glove. I think the work that they're doing is really, really, really important to illustrate and open the doors um, so that we're not going knocking on doors. Somebody's coming over and knocking on our doors. We need to work together to develop this uh, this this method to establish the ROI for us in particular. I don't know. I hope that helps. The and Rayanne Zach, as a follow on to to that discussion, and again, this gets back to the, the original. Uh, you you can pay for product or you can pay for practices, and uh, on a lot of of well. NRCS is like the, the the best example of paying for practices. And to what extent can you or do, do those uh, avoided costs of the conservation activity, whether it's for habitat or uh, for watershed quality, whatever value you're looking at, to what extent are can you or do you integrate those considerations into into that front end decision making process for that conservation activity? Hopefully, that made sense as a question. <laughs> yeah, it did. So um, I'll take a stab at it first, and so um, I, we. We certainly, that's the way we articulate things to our producers, right? Um, management practices in general, uh, you know, they're gonna reduce your inputs. They're gonna increase your yield. Um, you're gonna see a bottom dollar uh, savings of some kind or benefit, right, in the long run. Uh, in my world, I think, and this is probably what Zach was referring to later, is a lot of times that really depends on your perspective as a grower on the landscape because you know the the benefit that you gain from selling your product um which sometimes uh has a disadvantage to wildlife habitat um is can be huge and and how do we how do we make a payment for conservation that can compete with the prices that producers can get for some things. You know, in California, we have very high cash value crops out here. And so, um, you know, I, I've been reminded recently that for our easement program, uh, where we have see a lot of interest is in the Northern part of the state where a lot of our wet habitat exists. Um, and people would like to see more of that habitat um, preserved or expanded. But right now we're having a migration of uh, perennial systems, orchard crops that are, are moving into those, those habitat areas. And so it's, it's very beneficial for the producer out there, right, to uh, see the yields coming in off of something like an orchard crop. That's a, that's a really high cash value crop. Um, and our easement programs, I think, are struggling with the, um, uh, the valuation of the property in those areas in order to put them into an easement. So, you know, I, I do think that we have a lot of competing markets here where um, our land producers and, and like you said, Tom, the, the people who, who, who might benefit from some of these conservation avenues uh, in the long run on a larger scale from a grander perspective, it's, it's really hard to label that right now because hindsight is always what paints that picture for us. Um, and so I'll, uh, the, the modeling that, that Tom was talking about and you know some of making up uh, some of these um, strategies that, that Zach's been uh, alluding to on how to take simplistic government programs and, and make sure that you know they're compatible with the needs going forward. I think all of that you know it just requires a lot of that continuous dialogue and paying attention and um, you know things shape shift so fast uh, that it, it can become challenging to keep up with a lot of that. But um, you know 
I do think that there has been a very renewed interest uh, across the board in finding ways for all of us to work together. You know, the sandbox is getting smaller, so to speak. And so it's really forcing us to, to take a look at these opportunities that we might have and fine tuning them. So, um, you know, a lot of the points that Zach brought up about um, CRP, we're hearing a lot of that here in California. And it's not been a very CRP heavy state because the soil rental rates that are offered um, through FSA, you know, they're all based on dry land agriculture and we're irrigated out here, which changes things tremendously. So there is a lot of room, I think, for conversations um, and, and how we make that uh, work for, for the benefit of uh, everybody. Like I said, you know, NRCS, we're really in the market of making sure that the conservation strategies that we're putting on the landscape are compatible with the producers and what they need to get done on the landscape as well. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and Troy, I guess, going back to your question, if I can remember it correctly, um, what, what came to mind to me actually was thinking about sage grouse, where you had kind of this interesting confluence of interests that all had some economic stake in the health of that bird, or I guess more specifically, the bird not getting listed. Um, and so, you know, you saw these markets pop up where there was an oil and gas impact or an oil and gas interest um, that could be offset or mitigated on private land. And, you know, in particular in states like Montana, where a lot of the best sage grouse habitat um, is on private land, you know, I think you can see things like that flourish. And there were state programs that were developed, you know, Working Lands for Wildlife um, under NRCS did a lot on the practice side. Um, you know, the product side is a little bit, I guess I'm not 100% sure exactly what it is in this example. Um, but anyway, it was it was just like you 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 can see I think based on kind of that clear, but it was it was you know it was it was big macro projections that were driving that I think you know, like you you could get down to scales and companies could probably figure out what the impact to their specific bottom line would be if sage grouse were to be listed in terms of consultations or you know whatever additional regulatory restrictions are. But there were at least from where I sat, were a lot of big macro trends driving that. Um, the challenge, you know, that was very reactive. It was it was waiting until we were at the 11th hour and pulling something something together that was pretty amazing, you know, um, around that first not warranted decision. The, the, what I think a lot of people are thinking about now is how do you create markets for proactive at risk species conservation where, you know, there may not be an ESA nexus yet, but we know it's coming. Um, and, and it's, there's just not, I think the right signals being sent necessarily there yet. So, I think until it's it, it like I, I I would struggle to come up with exactly what a metric that could drive that is. I know there's been some attempts at the federal level. The Fish and Wildlife Service I know put out a policy around voluntary pre-listing conservation markets that was supposed to um, hopefully catalyze some action on the state side and develop some of these markets. I think it's it's um, you know not been fully utilized. So um, anyway, that was that was kind of a long response, but that was just where my where my head went. Well, that. Uh, uh... An interesting element of that, and I'll use sage grass as an example, is you can provide incentives to get private landowners to take positive action. And, but if I remember correctly, part of the difficulty was getting the public landowners incentivized to, to make sure that those improvements and, and habitat protections were integrating across ownerships. And if, if, there's, if there's one thing I heard from all three of you very clearly, it's that everybody's got to be working together um, on, on these issues. If you're, if just the federal government or just state lands or just private landowners are are doing something it's it's not going to have it's not going to achieve what we're trying to accomplish on 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 a landscape scale and so what are i i guess my then this is my question what are the how do you create structures that 
when you're incentivizing private landowners to do something through the good work that Ray Ann does, how do you how do we make sure that the outcomes we're trying to achieve on the on the on those private lands are being applied on a landscape scale across those different ownerships? How does that get coordinated? How does the what's that in a incentivization structure on private land or on public lands look like? Um, I say that with the caveat that uh, the other thing I've heard very clearly from all of you is that one size doesn't fit all, that, that you've got to have uh, a variety of structures um, and incentives and programs in place that that can all work together to accomplish what, we're, what is, well, to accomplish a wide variety of objectives that hopefully all are moving uh, a landscape um, health in a good direction. Um, so back to the original question, my first question, how do you make sure that, that we're syncing up the incentives that were, or the practices we're trying to accomplish on private lands uh, with activities that are going on on public lands in, in, in terms of an incentives. So, I mean, we have a couple of examples of how that works. Um, one of them is the Joint Chiefs Initiative uh, where we work in connection with the Forest Service uh, where there is a concern on public lands and there is an interface with private lands and uh, NRCS believes that we can bring something to the table to help the private lands and Forest Service has uh, some funding to deal with the work on the, the federal side. Um, and those proposals go in every year and, and are selected. We have about a half a dozen of those here in California that we manage in any given time. Um, another example of, of how USDA has worked with that is through, um, and NRCS specifically, is through the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. So uh, there's a pot of funding that's set aside every year for partners to make applications uh, for a partnership program that is a one-to-one -one match from the partner and NRCS. And it's, it's fairly similar in that uh, the, the dollars that the partner brings to the table do not necessarily have to equal what NRCS would put into the project. Um, but for sake of a very simplistic example, if you have a stream where there's a business that's on the stream that would benefit for having it uh, in, a, in a better state, you know, maybe flooding is a problem down the stream, there might be a community that's there, a county that's involved, you might have agricultural producers along the same stream, and, and maybe, you know, flooding might be an issue, habitat might be a desire, uh, whatever it might be. So uh, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program allows partners to apply for a pot of NRCS funding that would then be married with all of those other partners who are putting additional funds into the pot to solve a specific need on the landscape. Um, so it's, it's a really great um, example of something that's identified at a very local level that is a significant need. Um, and it really stays away, way outside of that one size fits all box. Um, I can definitely tell you, we do not have one size fits all um, RCPP projects uh, that happen. So it is a unique opportunity. Um, I also know that there's been, and I've had very little involvement in this, but the uh, recent announcement of the, I think there's $1 billion worth of grants in the Climate Smart Commodities Ag Pro, uh, Grant Program. Uh, that's been offered by USDA NRCS. And uh, it's really looking at a lot of these markets, right, that we've been talking about. And it's it, USDA really wants to have some proposals submitted through that grant process um, for our partners to take on and demonstrate and um, expand some of these market opportunities that you're talking about uh, through that program. Uh, so I think that we're on the doorstep 
of seeing a lot of unique ideas coming across the finish line under that program. And I'm gonna be certainly paying attention to see what kind of projects uh, get funded through that. I think it's gonna offer us a, a whole new set of resources, ideas, and, and opportunities to really advance some of these conversations that we're talking about. Joint Chiefs is a great framework to, that gets you, that gets NRCS and Forest Service uh, lined up on prioritization. And yeah, that's an incredibly helpful um, and, and useful tool. Um, the, does that allow you to, to do similar work, the Joint Chiefs Program, does that allow you to do similar efforts with, for example, BLM or any of those interior agencies? Or, or maybe the better question is, are there opportunities to integrate and, and collaborate with your counterparts at Interior on, on similar? So efforts? I think that the, the closest nexus that we have right now, I'm not familiar with every um, possible set of state versus federal uh, arrangements that have been created across the nation. I can speak to what, what's happening here in California, um, but, the, uh, the farm bill, this last farm bill did open up uh, the ability for our private landowners who do have uh, grazing leases or allotments on BLM land to apply uh, practices there more easily, let's put it that way. So there still are a fair number of, of issues that we have to work through with uh, those, those land holders, those easement holders um, and uh, the BLM, but it, it helps us, it helps the landowner. Um, in some cases, it, it certainly makes an impact on BLM lands. Um, so that's been one avenue that we've uh, been happy to see happen here in the state. Uh, but as far as uh, the coordinated effort between BLM and um, NRCS, I don't have as much experience with that one. I, I'm more experienced with uh, Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, they, they do have a program where they fund projects uh, through the Bureau of Reclamation. And NRCS has what we call a water smart program where we also offer the same type of a, a joint effort as we do with joint chiefs. So um, uh, a couple of efforts that I'm familiar with that we've, we've gone out in that same vein as with the joint chiefs program. The and and the 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 reason I asked about that and you already alluded to it is uh, farm bills up for reauthorization in next year. Um, one of the questions I want to ask all of you at the tail end of this uh, is, what are the things governors could be looking at? What are what are some of the things that we could be um, discussing as the farm bill comes up for reauthorization that would be useful um, and some sort of joint chiefs process that would bring interior agencies into 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 it would would seem to be one place where that might that might be a useful suggestion or thing for the governors to to think about um, Tom, Zach, you want to toss in on? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go real quick and, and build on uh, a couple of the points that, that Rayanne made. Uh, you know, so your, your question is, how do you stitch together the public and the private and make sure that it's in alignment, right? If we can incentivize the action on the, the private side, how do we make sure that the federal side of the line is following suit and vice versa? And I mean, if truth be told, uh, I don't think you guys will disagree with me. Uh, we're getting there, but we're not there yet. We're just, we're not particularly good at it. Uh, we've been living in our stovepipes for too long. It's, it's not a revolution. It's not gonna come as a silver bullet. It's gonna be more evolution and practice. And, you know, as I said, I think we're getting there. We've got great programs through Joint Chiefs and RCPP and others. Um, I, I mean, I, 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 where my mind went, I, I think it, it, there's a couple of things, right? So as uh, Rayanne pointed out earlier, um, one of the things is landscape planning. Um, we still live in our stovepipes when we plant, 
um, Joint Chiefs and RCP notwithstanding. Um, we marry together. We're going to do this on the private side and we're going to do this on the federal side. Can we stitch it together? Does it make sense? Does it hold together? Rather than actually coming together on the front end uh, is still the exception of the rule and taking the landscape and asking ourselves, what do we need to do irrespective of those jurisdictional lines? Um, I'd love to see some incentivization uh, to that end in the farm bill. Um, not that these programs are not good and valuable and, and they're, they're getting there, but I think we need to get a lot better on the landscape planning on the front end, blurring those lines. Um, and then the other thing that comes to my mind is that um, what I think we've seen a lot of lately, particularly in the fire and the um, infrastructure space, is a, a real interest in jumping to uh, the what and the, uh, I'm sorry, the where and the how. Uh, we want to have a conversation about where are the priorities and how, you know, what are all the barriers that we need to address? And we tend to skip right over the what. What are we actually trying to do in the landscape? What's the view and the vision of the local community and how does that align with our federal partners? Um, are we shooting at the same thing? And there's a lot of different things we can shoot at in terms of outcomes and impacts, right? We can talk about landscape resiliency, we can talk about community resiliency, we can talk about habitat resiliency. Those are not the same things. Um, and if we're not in alignment and understanding what it is we're trying to shoot at, um, it just complicates uh, trying to do that planning um, and we, we get ourselves disaligned right out of the gate. I'll plug the, <clears throat> the webinar we had Tuesday, which talked about planning tools as, um, as a place to look at. And part of that discussion was around okay, if if I'm live if I live in a well not just a wooey community but be, but because I do I'll use that as the example. Um, how do planning tools work in terms of what I value as a member of that community? For me, wildfire mitigation is pretty high up on the list, but so is so is water quality because. All of our drinking water comes off of the Mount Evans watershed. So if there's a big fire up there, then I don't have any good drinking water. Um, it just plus I've you know the the wildfire effect generally. Um, so so how do you how do you plug those values into the land planning process. And that, that, that was a lot of what we talked about on Tuesday. Um, what you were talking about is uh, in terms of the, the best place to, to integrate those different uh, What's going on with on public lands? What's going on private lands? How do they how do they sync up? Um, I, based on what I heard Tuesday, I I know an answer for this, but Tom, I'll ask you what's what's the right place? What's the right um, uh, phase in decision making process where that needs to get integrated, taken into consideration and feed into uh, decision-making. So you're, you're drawing me out on the question, is it top down or bottom up? Is that it? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks for that, Troy. Um, <laughs> My own view, and I'm not necessarily speaking for AFF uh, per se, is it, it, it's not either or, it's gotta be both and. Um, forest service, and, and I'll pick on the forest service, service for a second, can't say, okay, we've done this really neat assessment that points to all of these high priority areas, this is where we're gonna work, um, nor can the local community say, no, that's not right, this is where we're gonna work, we're never gonna get anywhere. Um, I would rather see a, a system, and I think we're kind of getting there, backing our way into it, where 
you've got a, a national framework, you've got a national vision, you've got an established what? It's landscape resiliency. Um, and according to this assessment, these are the priority places. Now let's take that view and inform it and refine it bottoms up. It doesn't have to be just squished down from the top. We can take this framework, we can say, okay, locally, how does that make sense? How do we refine that view from what we know on the ground or through state forest action plans or other planning processes? Um, how do we tweak what is a uh, arguably a top-down view and say, if we're going to be shooting at this what, it's not a habitat what, it's not necessarily a, you know, whatever the what is, this is what it needs to look like on the ground. So, I mean, maybe that's Pollyannish of me or, I, you know, not wanting to choose sides. But I, I really do think it's got to be a little bit of both um, or we're never going to get there. Zach or Rayanne, feel free to jump in. One of the cool things, Rayanne, about what NRCS does is you're not forcing your selves on anybody. The, the people you work with are willing landowners. And so there's already an education level of, of in, mo in most cases, folks already have a good idea of what they're going to get by working with you uh, when they come knocking on your door. Um, and you're not shoving this down anybody's throat. Um, so I'm sure that's that's helpful when you're uh, trying to figure out how to work with the people that you're working with, if that made sense. Yeah, um, it does. And we have a system in place with NRCS where we utilize what are called local work groups. Um, and uh, local work groups are made up of producers that live within a service area. Uh, partners and um, they come together annually and give feedback to the local offices. Our district conservationists are the managers of those local offices. And then the input that we get from them really helps to, you know, determine are, are the needs of the producers within that region being met? Um, you know, is it NRCS that needs to fill that gap? Are there other partners that are available to fill that gap? And then we utilize some of that information in the ranking process that we use in the state because everything's competitively evaluated. So we fold that information into how we roll our programs out. Um, I think that one of the key issues, though, uh, was brought up much earlier. I can't remember if it was Zach or Tom or both of you, but it's really this concept of dealing with national programs uh, in the West and being able to utilize them effectively on our landscape that becomes important because um, we do experience some national programs that come out that are better suited to uh, systems that are rotational crop systems, you know, corn, soybeans, and, and things of that nature. And so, you know, making sure that the West is at the table um, in conversations about how the programs could benefit us better out here um, is certainly an important conversation going forward. And I think we're getting more and more partners uh, interested in, in engaging in that dialogue um, instead of just sitting back and saying, whoa, we don't know what to do with that. So <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, it's getting there. It's progress. Yeah, and, and I think, Troy, I, I really couldn't have said it better than Tom did, so I won't reiterate his points. I, I think um, one thing that is important in that equation, though, where you're trying to find that space where bottom up meets top down, where there's some high level priorities that are then implemented or refined at the local level is, you know, we can't pretend that all of these local communities are the same when it comes to the capacity to actually move this work forward. So you may have some places where there's a really effective local field office and a great local collaborative that's working really well and stuff can take off there and that's great. But, you know, you go over a couple counties and it's a dysfunctional conservation district. Um, folks on, on either side don't wanna play ball. And it's not to say that it can't get there, but I think this capacity building component of if we're really gonna do locally led and say that we mean it, you know, people like to fund projects and they like to see acres but that capacity building and that community component is just as critical, I think, to, to getting to, you know, 
the vision that Tom laid out of how this could work. And um, I guess one other point, going back to your question about incentives on kind of intermixing the private public landscape that I do just want to underscore is, you know, you could have the best set of incentives in the world and, and every single program that checks every box. And it doesn't matter if people can't access them, if they're not being delivered well, if the silos are preventing them from being implemented effectively. So I think that's another component of this that, that we really want to address is, is some of those um, some of those issues on, on that end. So just wanted to flag that as well. And that's one of the things we heard loud and clear. We had four workshops with this, with this initiative in uh, Utah, uh, Colorado, Alaska, and Idaho. And one of the things we heard like reinforced loud and clear every single time was the, these capacity concerns and the need to address um, capacity. And, and what I mean by capacity, I mean, it, it's capacity at, at every level from, from federal agencies, mm. uh, states, local governments, all the way down to the, the people that are gonna be implementing uh, these IJ projects or, or any kind of work that's, that's uh, being funded. Um, and the capacity issue, especially around programs that require an application to a federal agency um, and or are going to require a matching uh, payment from an entity. Uh, if, if, I'm a, if I'm a state or a local government that knows how to deal with and it is familiar with the application processes, um, I'm probably gonna have a pretty easy time getting more money out of, out of this. If, if I'm a resource constrained community, I don't have a lot of experience working with the federal government. I don't have familiarity with some of the programs um, and the funding that's available. And if I can't come up with a match, um, then I'm, I'm probably going to be left behind. And what, what, one of the things that has come up time and again over the course of this initiative is, um, those folks who, who don't have that experience, who may not have the access to that funding for a match, who they need help, or they're going to just get left further behind. Um, as as this entire process rolls out, um, the I'll let you guys respond to what I just said, and then I'm looking at the clock, and we're already like perilous, perilously close to the end of our time together. So I'll wrap up after Tom goes. Well, yeah, no, I appreciate that. I I, I can't help myself but to uh, jump in and 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 reiterate Zach's point. Um, uh, your point, Troy, on, on that it, it collaborative capacity in particular, right? We've got implemented capacity we need. We've got planning capacity. We've got a whole range of capacities that are need. Um, but it is that collaborative capacity that can serve as a function of stitching together all of these different actors. I mean, I, I joke that, I mean, how half of our job is, is acting as a marriage counselor between agencies. Um, uh, and uh, no slight intended, right? Which you've got actors who have just not had a history of working together or there's stuff in the system that needs to get worked through. Um, that's a really key uh, role and capacity that needs to be played that's I think currently undervalued and, and it's hard to get a grant. Uh, but that self-same collaborative capacity to provide that marriage counseling can also... Um, provide that support to some of those underserved communities that you're talking about. Um, in any given landscape, not two communities are created equal. Um, and in that coordination or that collaborative capacity, can we make sure that we're looking at the whole enchilada and reaching out to those communities that are, are less uh, empowered, 
to make sure that they're working right along with those communities that are. Um, we don't have landscape captains. We need landscape captains to help shepherd these players and these processes into a coherent whole. Um, I can't believe it, but we're already pretty much done with the time we've got available. Um, but, uh, but I did promise, and I, and and we're going to make time for it. Um, to to let each of you just talk for a few minutes about um, what are some of the things governors should be thinking about right now as as you look forward to things that they can do, the stuff that they can be pushing for, or or at least should be looking at as Farm Bill comes up for for reauthorization, um, what could be, what could they be doing better? What could we all be doing better to try to address some of these challenges, uh, land management challenges? And, and uh, again, remembering that, that this was supposed to be, even though we got off track a few times, a, a, convert, a, a conversation about conservation markets. Um, what could they be doing specifically in that space too? I'll, I'll say this too, we barely scratched the surface. We didn't talk about tax incentives. We didn't talk about what other kind of structures uh, could be in place, what kind of, of incentives um, to, for private investment. Um, so we, we should have done th three or five of these, but, uh, Given given that we're we're at time, I'll start off. We can go in the same order that we started. And Rayanne, I'll go to you first, and then Tom and Zach. But just some things for governors to think about. I think I'm going to keep my statement fairly short, so I'll defer my time to the the folks who can really provide their governors some feedback on on how to how to get plugged in. Um, <laughs> you know uh, the. I think the critical thing for me, we've all said it time and time again here, which is, you know, looking at what the priorities are within your state and then looking at what the federal government's got in its toolkit, right? And, and is it working? And if it's not, you know, who do you need to talk to about why it's not working and, um, you know, stay involved in the conversation uh, where it's a key issue for you. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, I've only been with this agency for 20 years, uh, but the, the concept of repackaging the same thing that we have in different forms and, and you know, um, putting it out there to solve objectives, you know, it's, it's very rare that we see a brand new thing happen, right? Um, we have different ways of using the tools that already exist. And we've heard, uh, you know, Zach talk a lot about the existing tools and how they might need to be tweaked a little bit better to achieve the accomplishments and the priorities in the West. So um, I think the, the two gentlemen here probably have some pretty good input on what the governors might pay attention to. Thank you. No, I, I think you said it well, Rayanne, and, and um, uh, that's where my mind went, right? It, it's not, uh, the Farm Bill does not necessarily have to present an opportunity for a whole raft of new programs and new initiatives and new tool sets um, we've got a whole lot of very effective tools uh, in the system today that frankly need refining. Uh, they're not optimized. They're not working as well as they should be. Um, and, you know, my advice as it were to, to the governors would be, you know, take a hard look at, at the programs um, and look for those opportunities for refinement, as we said earlier, uh, passing it through a Western lens. Um, how does it roll out on the ground in the West? And are there opportunities to tweak it to ensure that it delivers maximum value um, in Western landscapes? Um, yeah, I, I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, very much appreciate it. Yeah, those, those are both great points. Um, and just to add, I guess, slightly to it, um, in the lens of kind of tweaking existing programs or thinking about making what's already there work better, a few examples come to mind. Um, so one, making sure that programs work well together and where there's um, barriers real or perceived, whether it's in statute or in implementation, examining that. So for example, like CRP and EQIP, um, 
you know, how could those two programs maybe be bundled to work more effectively together for greater outcomes? RCPP, I think, you know, the intent is great. In practice, there's some real challenges in delivering and implementing it. Um, making sure that RCPP is actually going to um, truly local priorities and ensuring that local groups, maybe without the means to put up the match, could still be eligible. Um, looking at things like that. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think finally on, on the capacity building side, you know, in the last farm bill, there were some tweaks around delivery to allow certain entities to deliver those programs. So like irrigation districts um, specifically around certain water practices, you know, maybe there's more creative thinking to be done there, looking at some of these place-based collaboratives or watershed groups and how to empower them and put them in more of the driver's seat in delivering some of these. And of course, with that, bringing along the necessary capacity to do so. So um, yeah, I think I think to sum it up, it's it's capacity and it's it's tweaking what we have to work better. Um, okay, hour and a half is gone. Um, the, the cool thing about the three of you is that you all look at this from such different angles. Um, and so the, the perspectives are very different, but you have all said a lot of of things that that sync up well together um so so i really appreciate the the, the wonderful expertise and and uh that you all bring to the table um i really appreciate you taking the time to do this today and contribute to um the working lands working communities initiative uh the work that western governors are doing um, all, all of you are really important partners um, for us and, and really appreciate you letting us borrow your brains today, but also letting us take advantage of, of uh, the friendships and relationships that we have with you on an ongoing basis. Um, for the folks that are watching, really appreciate you taking the time to join us today um, and providing some great questions, some good input. Um, with that, I think we let everybody go. Um, you guys have a great day. And again, thanks for your time here.